Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Timothy Curry, and I'm the Midwest Associate Director for Practice Implementation for the Mayo Clinic Center for Individualized Medicine. I would like to welcome you to the Center for Individualized Medicine Grand Rounds. The Sim Grand Rounds Lecture Series is designed to highlight the latest in scientific discovery and innovation and demonstrate how individualized medicine is being translated into practice to meet current and future patient needs. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Kim Boycott. Dr. Boycott is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Ottawa in Canada, where she is a clinical geneticist at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, CHEO, chair of the Department of Genetics and a senior scientist at the CHEO Research Institute. Dr. Boycott is a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Rare Disease Precision Health, whose research program bridges clinical genomics to basic research and is focused on understanding the molecular pathogenesis of rare diseases to improve patient care and family well-being. She leads the National Care for Rare Canadian Consortium, integrating genomic and other omic technologies to improve our understanding of rare disease with a particular focus on solving the unsolved and most difficult rare diseases. To leverage these discoveries, she co-leads the Canadian Rare Diseases Models and Mechanisms Network, established to catalyze connections between newly discovered rare disease genes and basic scientists who can rapidly study them in model systems. Globally, she moves the rare disease agenda forward as part of the Global Commission to End the Diagnostic Odyssey for Children. Today, this presentation will focus on defining the paradigm shift in the approach to rare diseases since the introduction of genome-wide sequencing analysis summarizing the impact, benefits, and challenges of integrating bioinformatics, new technologies, global sharing strategies, and functional studies on the discovery of new causes of rare diseases, and proposing a clinical and research workflow for how to investigate patients with undiagnosed rare genetic disease. Throughout this talk, please use the Q&A in Zoom to submit your questions for Dr. Boycott. We have planned time at the end of the session for you. For those who have not yet claimed continuing education credit, the code is C-A-P-L-A-Z. A message will also be sent out in the chat short in the chat shortly. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Boycott. Um, so thank you, Timothy, for that kind introduction and to uh, everyone for this lovely um, invitation to present to you today. Um, I am going to spend um, about 45 minutes. We'll have some time at the end for questions, which I think will be a wonderful opportunity for discussion. Uh, speaking to you about how we have addressed the most challenging rare genetic diseases in Canada. And so the objectives that I outlined um, uh, for this presentation today is really to look at, um, you know, how things have changed since we've had genome-wide sequencing analysis available to us, which in some places has been as uh, for as long as a decade. Um, but then look at some of these challenges uh, around informatics, new technologies, and the importance of um, global data sharing and functional studies to help resolve some of these variants and genes of uncertain significance. And then look at, um, from our research program, um, the, how the workflow um, is going to be influenced by multiomics as these become uh, available for clinical testing. So to start with, um, the uh, group of conditions I'm gonna talk about, about today are the rare genetic diseases. So when we use the word, uh, when we use the phrase rare disease, that um, usually comes associated with a number like 300 million people worldwide are affected. What I'm talking about today, though, are rare genetic diseases and the rare monogenic uh, diseases. So it's a subset of all rare diseases, which, of course, and it can include things like rare cancers and autoinflammatory diseases, etc. Um, so I'm really looking at the, the group of conditions where uh, one change or two changes within a gene um, are enough to give um, to, to cause clinical signs and symptoms. Now, in the international uh, data sets uh, and knowledge bases, there are more than um, 6,000 rare genetic diseases known, and of the, they're caused by about 4,000 um, disease gene associations thus far, but there are thousands that remain unsolved. And just on the right of this slide is just a a recognition of Rare Disease Day, um, which um, has has uh, been around for almost a decade now, and is usually on uh, is on February twenty eighth or 29th um, every year. So the reason I became interested in this as a clinical geneticist many years ago now, like fifteen or so, um, is because of the patient experience, which is best described as a diagnostic odyssey. It's captured here, um, which really. Um, really describes 
uh, a very frustrating process uh, for patients and their families as they sort of roam, roam around in our healthcare system, going from one specialist to the other, sometimes given the wrong diagnosis, um, having test after test after test um, to finally arrive at a diagnosis. And this, this diagnostic odyssey can you know, it, we sort of have Canadian data to suggest it's five to seven years long, but I certainly see families that have been part of the research program and a few of the examples I'll show you today that have been on a diagnostic journey for more than 40 years. Um, and so um, the work I'm going to show you today is really um, uh, the uh, outcome of ten, more than 10 years of uh, a, a series of national networks that are described here, began in, with um, Forge Canada in 2011. Um, I'll talk about Care for Air and Care for Air Solve, um, which have been ongoing since 2013, so 10 years for them. The Rare Disease Models and Mechanism Network since 2015, and most recently, um, a network we call All for One, which is really focused on data sharing and access to research for patients. Now, if the goal here is to have a, um, a, a diagnosis, oops, sorry, a diagnosis for all rare genetic diseases. And so this really has two components in my mind. Uh, the first is access. Um, uh, so everyone has to be able to have uh, access to the appropriate genetic test at the right time in their diagnostic journey. And the second is we have to understand the mechanisms of all uh, rare genetic diseases. And so we need to understand all the variants and all the genes that can be associated with these issues. So it's really a two-pronged problem. So let's start with access. Um, and so we all know, I think probably, that clinical genome-wide sequencing is the best test there's ever been uh, in genetics, and I would argue in many areas of medicine. Um, and you can see a little picture there of one of my patients, Abby, um, who uh, is now 12 years old, and I've known her since she was just under two, um, who has an undiagnosed, actually, cerebellar ataxia. Um, and now we know, we know that hundreds of thousands of rare disease patients have been clinically sequenced, um, and the diagnostic yield for this test is somewhere in between 30, 35 percent, really depends on which um, which uh, uh, patient cohorts you're looking at. Um, and there's been variable access to this testing across Canada, and I'll sort of explain a bit more about that. Um, and a lot of this comes to the fact that um, introducing two new technologies can be quite challenging. And so the way I've seen it, I didn't really ever, I wasn't really ever trained or had any expertise in health services research, but I've had to develop some and make some friends uh, in this area. But the way I see it is really three, uh, three different ways that this can be approached. Um, there are top-down approaches, um, which is the great example for that is something like Genomics England and the NHS, um, where they come in and say, this is what we're going to offer to everybody, standardize it, and it's accessible across the country. On the far right side is the rearrange, and that's where a lab has a certain set of resources and changes how they deliver their test. This is a very European approach. Um, and I live in the bottom-up <laughs> model. So despite the fact that we have a single payer um, in the province I live in, which is Ontario, um, it has very much been uh, bringing in new technologies is challenging. Um, and we have to work with these uh, decision makers um, and funders um, to provide the evidence they need uh, for things like their health technology assessments and their value for money assessments um, in order to get um, testing approved. Once it becomes approved in a province like mine, um, it becomes accessible to everybody. So this was a very therapeutic um, a diagram that I developed um, a little while ago, uh, which really says, you know, around 2013, our research program in Canada was showing that, you know, genome-wide sequencing at that time, exome sequencing, had great diagnostic utility, pretty much no matter where you were in your diagnostic journey at the beginning or way at the end, the diagnostic utility was still way over 30%. Um, but it is, it's taken us... Um, not eight years to get out to the other end, which is um, to have this test available and performed within our province. And as you can see, as you sort of walk through that maze, there were a number of things that we we thought we needed to do in order to, to make that a faster um, route. So for example, in 2015, we wrote the best practice guidelines for Canada on how to use this technology. Um, and I thought, oh, okay, cool, we're done. Um, this should allow everybody to get the test. Well, I had no idea the other steps that needed to happen after that, which included um, 
you know, developing el local eligibility criteria, um, provincial consenting, data governance frameworks, technical specifications. How do you build a program to br bring this into a province of, of our size? And how do you implement it and evaluate that with real world data? Um, and so this is what we have finally done. And in 2021, we started a two year pilot called Genome Wide Sequencing Ontario. And so this is the province I live in. Most of the population is down uh, down here, as you can see, where all the little um, the all the little uh, lines of, for the big cities line up. Um, the population of Ontario is about fourteen point five million people, and as I said, it is a single payer system, so everybody is covered under the same OHIP program. Um, and so we developed a two year um, project in collaboration with our Ministry of Health um, to offer this test. Um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, cert with a certain set of eligibility criteria. And um, so far, we've actually sequenced over um, uh, 3,000 individuals. We have a diagnostic yield of 31%, which is on par with the literature. But the very important thing that I think we did here, because prior to 2021, our, some patients were getting access to this, but we were sending everything out to the United States. Um, and as a result, when we send everything out to the United States, the data stays in the United States um, and the ministry has, has no eyes on um, how the test is performing. Um, and so when we brought it in in 2021, we did two really important things. The first is that we made sure we could share data across um, institutions and across uh, the country. And we made uh, we made it such that the consent form uh, includes a recontact for research. So every patient has the ability to share their genomic data if they wish um, through a centralized um, platform for secondary use of that data. And that's what's referred to as the all for one, um, which is a precision health partnership for Canada. And so just to briefly show one slide on this, we really envisioned a two-pronged solution um, for All for One. And All for One is, crosses all areas of medicine, but it is starting with rare genetic diseases. And what we really want to do for the clinical arm of this uh, data sharing strategy is to share across the clinical diagnostic labs. So that means that if I live in a province of almost 15 million people, but Newfoundland has 500,000 people, that the patients in Newfoundland will have just as many, uh, just as many data sets for comparison as a patient from Ontario. So we need to be able to share um, our data for clinical purposes across provincial boundaries. Um, and the second aspect of this is the All for One Connect platform, uh, which is an opt-in registry to connect patients with research. Um, and so they become visible and findable uh, for sharing genomic data, for all kinds of purposes, including discovery, um, but also for natural history studies and clinical trials. Um, and so we're currently launching a pilot uh, in this transition phase of the Connect platform to actually look at how many patients and families will actually sign up and then move on to, um, to do um, the studies. It's actually quite an interesting question. It's one thing when you recruit a patient one-on-one, -on -one, it might be quite another when you recruit them via platform uh, and the uptake may be different. Um, and I and you know when we think about access, uh, I just want to step um, to to talk to you about two other things before we move on. And the first is um, thinking about um, machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence, which of course is all the buzz and everything, including genetics. Um, but what we've developed is something called Think Rare, and we have had um, an electronic health record. Uh, at our institution here at CHEO for the past eight years. So we have the most data of any institution in Canada. Um, and we developed a search algorithm uh, to search our EPIC data warehouse to look for patients who would be eligible uh, for genome-wide sequencing. Um, and it's a rule-based expert system approach um, that lets us try to, that lets us uh, ultimately flag patients in our electronic health record that may have a complex and undiagnosed rare genetic disease. Um, currently, the sensitivity, so being able to find patients we've already offered this test to is quite high. Uh, that number is actually out of date. It's on our current version four, it's actually 100%. Um, the specificity, though, is still around 60 to 70%, which means the false positive rate um, can be high, which of course is going to put more burden on the clinical genetics um, team. Um, and therefore, um, the most responsible physician still needs to make decisions about whether or not referrals for genome wide sequencing are actually appropriate. Um, but that we are we are currently testing the first um, group of patients who have been flagged by this algorithm, um, and we're awaiting their genome wide sequencing results. The other thing I just want to quickly show you is uh, the our other interest, especially because Canada is such a large um, 
country with lots of patients who are quite remote, either in Canada's near north or far north. Uh, both, both of those areas are actually serviced by my institution, Northern Ontario and the, um, the province of Nunavut or the territory of Nunavut. Um, and so uh, is there a way that patients can participate um, in their genome-wide sequencing studies by phenotyping themselves? And so we're currently running a self-phenotyping study here, which is prospective. Um, and families are self-phenotyping themselves, and then they're being, uh, the phenotype is being captured by the clinical team. And both of these um, set of HP, uh, human phenotype ontology, or HPO terms, are being captured and used to analyze the genome-wide sequencing data to see how effective families are um, in, in um, being able to understand uh, some of the aspects of the rare disease and, and what might be important for a diagnosis. It's actually quite, a, quite an interesting um, uh, outcome so far. I'd be happy to talk about it more if we have time in the discussion. But basically, when we piloted this, we had very um, engaged families who understood everything about what was going on for, for their for their particular loved one. Um, but when you do it prospectively, it's quite a different story, actually. And the variability is quite high. Um, so now I just want to move um, in terms of, you know, from access and how we uh, we do this on a you know a, a health system scale um, to lo locally how we need to think about different a little bit differently about discovery in the clinic. Um, and when I refer to that, what we really are thinking about is you know um, you know why why is the diagnostic yield only thirty or thirty five percent? And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one of them is probably the fact that maybe the, the the etiology is more complex or not monogenic. Can't can't rule those sorts of things out. Um, another one is that maybe the genetic etiology is undetectable to that technology being used, and we'll talk about that at the end of the talk. Uh, but the one I want to focus on now is the gene has not yet been discovered to be associated um, with that particular um, set of clinical signs and symptoms. So we developed a protocol um, for undiagnosed um, families, and it's we've we've discussed this in two um, publications that you can see there if you want more information. Because I recognize that little image on the right is quite uh, minuscule, but basically we looked at um, breaking down the unsolved cohort into four different groups um, and looking at that group to understand why we have not reached a molecular diagnosis for that particular family. And the first group is really things like that we know clinically what that family has, but the standard clinical testing has not um, identified a diagnosis. And the best example of that is, you know, things like tuberous sclerosis or NF1, where we have a clinical criteria that says, yes, this is a clinical diagnosis. We do the clinical test and we don't find it. So we know that um, disease causing variant is hiding in one of those genes. And why can't we see it? So it's a technology issue. The second group um, is that uh, the very genetically heterogeneous disorders, and there's a few reasons why we wouldn't be able to solve somebody in that group, one of which could be just like what I just talked about um, with not being able to find the variant in those genes that are known. The other is, of course, that the gene may not yet be known, uh, and therefore you have to take a different approach for that group. The third group are, is the um, unsolved recognizable disorders, and those are the sort of, you know, there's a few of them left um, where, you know, lots of people around the world have tried exome genome and other types of omics on them and not been able to ever find an etiology. For example, um, the association of Vactoral, which is a group of congenital anomalies that uh, is a diagnosis of exclusion, but quite recognizable in babies uh, when they are born with things like anal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula, vertebral differences, heart differences, etc. Um, and so when you think about those sorts of things, we have to think about mechanistic um, contributions that are outside the coding genome um, to, to sort of sort those out. And a number of those are actually probably mosaic. And then the last group, which is what I'm going to focus on, um, are the previously undescribed disorders. And those are um, disorders that don't have a name yet. Um, they're not recognizable as being syndrome X, um, but there's lots of clinical signs and symptoms. Um, and you study basically these, these patients or families one at a time. So what we did was try to apply this approach. Um, and I'm just going to talk about that last group, um, where this group of um, patients that you know don't have a, a diagnostic description other than a list of um, HPO terms, um, and had all had um, non-diagnostic exome sequencing, 
Um, and we uh, assembled a group of this from our 10 years of a group of patients, participants from our 10 years of work, um, more than 1,200. And we decided we we're going to put them through a standardized assessment, um, which included reanalysis of their existing data, followed by short read genome sequencing, RNA sequencing, and long read genome sequencing, and look at the diagnostic yield at each part um, of this pathway to see what the added utility of these new technologies were and what kinds of variants are they identifying that we're missing you know, using our other current clinical diagnostic care pathway. A lot of this to develop evidence so that we can bring in some of these new technologies as either primary or secondary um, tests for these patients. Um, and I'll focus first on this um, discovery tree, it's an apple tree. And as you can see, there's this bottom group in green, which are those that can be diagnosed by exome. So even though your um, exome may have been non-diagnostic three years ago, doesn't mean it's not diagnostic now. And that's because there are 250 to 300 new disease gene associations every year described in the online Mendelian inheritance in men. So no point throwing out that data, not relooking at it again, because you're just wasting your money. This And the second group, which is important for this part of, of um, the talk, is those that are tractable by exome. And in that, I mean, really, there are very interesting variants in genes that have not yet been associated with um, human disease. So the answer is there. We just don't have enough knowledge to, to say, yes, for sure, that's the answer, and we have to gain that knowledge. So all of this really tells us um, that secondary use of data for discovery for all of these patients who've had genome-wide sequencing as a clinical test is a really important part of their care pathway and almost in some ways should really not be considered primary research. It's really clinical um, translation type research that should actually be performed in the clinic. Um, and we should it would be ideal if we could get resources in the clinic to support this kind of work because there are lots of discoveries to be made. And so when we um, look at this, so this first taking the first 1294 families and reanalyzing all of them, um, there were 489 families or 38% that had candidate variants. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that means. Um, so for 109 of those families, so that's 8% of the whole cohort, um, they were diagnoses in known disease genes. And most of those had been identified in the last couple of years or had variants that were missed on previous um, informatics pipelines. The next group is about the 15%, where there's a variant of uncertain significance um, in a known disease gene that looks really interesting and compelling, and the clinician thinks it fits, but we don't have enough evidence yet to say that's likely pathogenic or pathogenic. And then the last group, which I want to talk about a little bit more, um, have a candidate variant or variants in a novel disease gene or a gene of uncertain significance. And I'm just showing up here on the, the top right an example of this, um, one of these examples. And so we had collected these five families um, in Care for Rare, and we had analyzed them over seven years ago. And they had um, global developmental delay, intellectual disability, progressive spasticity in these children. Um, it's recessive, as you can see from those pedigrees. Several of the families were French Canadian and they have white matter anomalies. And when we studied them seven years ago, we did not have any um, candidate variants identified. But when we updated our um, informatics pipeline and reran them, um, to reanalyze their data because they were unsolved, we all we identified they had biallelic mutations or biallelic uh, pathogenic variants in the gene ABHD16A, um, and we collected a large cohort. Now, this is a really interesting finding, actually, because uh, we're a small enough group that we don't usually find multiple families in our own cohort that have the same novel disease gene. We usually have to do something called matchmaking, which I'll tell you about in a sec, um, which means that those old pipelines were not, um, this is really probably very underdiagnosed, and those old pipelines that we were all using several years ago um, really was missing, um, being able to call this variant. So just going uh, to talk about matchmaking for a sec, because as I said, you know, our, our project has been national, but we're a fairly uh, small, small country. Um, so as a result, we don't necessarily find um, for some of these really ultra rare diseases, many families in, in Canada. And so we really relied heavily on something we call matchmaking. And we've broken this down into a, conce a conceptual framework uh, where you can see down the right hand side, two sided one sided, zero sided. And we're going to focus on the two sided for this talk. But what that means is like basically a game of go fish. 
And two people um, are coming in to these data sets and asking the question, do you have anybody with variants in this gene? And they both asking that same question. This is different than one sided where only one person is asking and going into the database or zero sided where a computer is just trying to figure it out. Um, and so what we uh, we launched is something called uh, called Genomics for RD. It's a Canadian platform uh, to share data with um, partners uh, across the country as well as the world um, that allows us to share our data in a variety of ways. All patients in Genomics for RD are consented for all kinds of data sharing, um, and it allows us to use this as a place place to launch out for matchmaking. Um, and so we launch uh, these interesting candidate genes out into the node called Phenome Central, which connects to the Matchmaker Exchange, which was launched in 2015 as an application programming interface that connects different databases across the world, including Phenome Central from Canada, but also um, big ones that you're probably aware of, like Gene Matcher, uh, Decipher in the UK, um, et cetera. And so it allows us to access many, many unsolved patients. Um, and so we uh, um, actually did a special issue of human mutation um, uh, in June of 2022, if anybody is interested. Um, and the most recent data we just put together is that we have um, data contributed from more than 104 countries now, which is actually substantial. Um, there are 15,000 unique genes and there are 134,000 unsolved patients that are coming across the network. So what that actually means is most of the time when you put in a query into Matchmaker Exchange, you get an answer, which is good and bad. So I'll just show you one quick example for those not familiar. And so this is Justin. You can see him as a baby and then as a 25-year-old. He's a patient of our institution for his whole life. Uh, he was undiagnosed at 25 years of age. And at that time, he came into our care for a project, and he had two de novo variants in, disease, in genes that had not been associated with human disease identified. Um, and so we needed to find additional families across the world. And so basically we entered the phenotypic data into Phenome Central, his genes, two genes of interest, and we want to connect it through genomic matchmaking to find anybody else in the world who might have the same thing. And so um, very interesting, you can see Justin's two genes there. One is green and one is orange. Um, and the green is USP7, and that's the first set of large matches that we made, um, connecting to a big group at Baylor, um, who had uh, collected a cohort of uh, over 20 individuals who all had de novo mutations in USP7. Um, and so Justin's first diagnosis was um, a USP7 neurodevelopmental disorder. On the left, you can see his family at the very first USP7 conference, which was held, which was held in um, Houston. Um, but the one thing about Justin is that his white matter changes didn't fit with the uh, what was known about the USP7 cohort. And so we, we still had his second gene in Matchmaker Exchange, um, and we had it in there for about nine months before we hit the second cohort. And you can see we uh, identified families in Europe and Australia, and they all had the exact same de novo change as Justin. Uh, and that was in the gene TMEM, uh, TMEM 106B. So Justin actually has two different de novo dominant diseases uh, explaining his complex presentation um, that were both discovered uh, in his mid-20s. And of course, that would be a very good explanation as to why he had a very long diagnostic odyssey. Um, so matchmaking, as you can see, is uh, is been amazing over the last seven years, um, and we know that um, there are over eight hundred discoveries now published um, that have been in the result of being able to share data across the world like this. But there are a few um, drawbacks to matchmaking, and we have to have a realistic. Um, expectation of it. The first is the very high false positive rate. And that false positive rate comes with thousands of emails exchanged um, by these as a result of these matches, um, which of course is requires manpower and, and focus. And so sometimes these things fall apart because people don't answer you. Uh, about half the people don't answer you uh, in terms of that. So it's really important that genotypic and phenotypic data are entered into these databases, even if they're, if they're not making it mandatory with respect to the phenotype and the inheritance, because that will reduce the number of emails that need to cross around um, to figure out what's going on. Um, and, the, you know, gene matcher does not 
require a phenotype, um, but it's a really good idea if you put the phenotype in, uh, because as I said before, most genes will have one match. So we put 190 candidate genes that we just described in our in our reanalysis into Matchmaker Exchange, the 15%, 7% or half-ish, uh, 85 have been validated and published, um, and the rest remain in various stages of, of um, discovery. And some of them are probably wrong, uh, but lots of them are right and are still collecting enough evidence to show that. Um, so matchmaking has been um, a super excellent approach for us. It's been very successful. Um, but the other thing is, though, um, we also wanted to think about um, model systems as a way to help develop evidence for disease gene associations. Um, and so we began to think about um, you know, how we could use these functional studies or model organism studies to help um, with some of these, because sometimes, at least at the, for sure, at the very beginning of matchmaker exchange, um, you often didn't make matches right away like you do now seven years later. Um, and so you needed to have a different approach. And so the idea around 2013 uh, actually came from the model organism community in Canada. Um, and what they wanted to do is have a way to get in on all this cool, interesting new um, disease gene associations we were discovering as a network um, and being able to study these um, really rapidly because they had expertise in that gene or that pathway uh, and resources in their lab right away. And so this was the idea of um, Matchmaker Exchange, which was essentially a dating service that at the time came with the $25,000 first date. Uh, now it's $35,000. So, you know, inflation. Um, and so this was about increasing collaboration and importantly for rare disease patients to have um, uh, an opportunity to have their disease studied uh, by a basic scientist and learn more about molecular insight. And so uh, we launched in 2014. There's our web page if you want to go and have a look. Um, and we have uh, had amazing success. I'm going to show you one example. And so this is uh, one of these the first family one is mine and family two is from um, the US and we connected via matchmaker exchange, um, but we only had two families and they had a change at the exact same amino acid. And so this uh, condition was similar in the two families and characterized by short stature. You can see the trunk and that little girl is also short. That's because she has these very flat um, vertebrae here. There are shortening of the um, distal uh, phalanges and there is a uh, epiphyseal uh, changes uh, in the bones, particularly the hips and the oldest um, individual in family family one has had a, had a hip replacement at um, bilateral at 30 years of age. And so we uh, connected through the um, Rare Disease Models and Mechanisms Network in Canada with a Professor Murshed, who I'd never met, but he is a, a, apparently the world expert on MGP in Canada. And uh, he developed a knock-in mouse for us uh, with uh, the, both those changes. And you can see here that um, uh, the mice are smaller with respect to their skeletons. They have very similar epiphyseal changes and essentially they recapitulate the phenotype. Uh, and that is just about to come out um, in Nature Communications. And I just had the opportunity last week to talk to my family about these mouse studies and show them the paper and walk through all those findings. And our work on this um, mechanism and how this gene works in the extracellular matrix is still ongoing with um, Professor Murshed. So that's very exciting and that family was really pleased. So overall, RDMM has made over 114 connections in the last, uh, oh, yeah, almost nine years now. Um, and I think the thing we're the most proud of is that we've partnered with, with um, patient organizations um, and they often do fundraising and we've been able to provide scientific oversight and matching funds so that they can actually have basic scientists work on models of their diseases of interest. And that has been um, really well received. Now, just moving a little bit to discovery, as I said earlier, what if the genetic etiology is undetectable to that technology that we're using? And how do we decide you know, which resources to put um, in which family and in what order? Um, and of course, this next wave of technologies that's coming along, um, you know, focus on genome, or, or on coding DNA, on, on RNA, um, we can look at mosaicism, and then the metabolomics, lipidomics, and epigenomics, I sort of see them as um, functional readout tests that can sometimes guide you in a uh, where to look in the, in the genome. Um, because when we, when exome sequencing came along in 2011, um, it was a pretty straight road. 
uh, you just found as many trios or recognizable syndromes as you could, and you sequenced everybody, and discoveries were made very easily. Um, the, the complexity of multiomics is different, um, and in a cost-constrained situation, um, we kind of need to have an, an approach. And so let's just look at how we're moving down this pathway. Um, uh, and so after reanalysis of exome sequencing, we talked about that group, you know, in terms of where we move them forward. Um, if they were negative with no compelling candidates, they went on to short read genome sequencing. And of that group, we had um, 82 of the 234 families that have gone through so far. So that's 35% uh, with candidate variants. Of those, um, we validated 12% of them and upgraded them to a diagnosis. Um, and about just over a third of them were um, variants that were intractable to exome sequencing. And that that's mostly small deletions. And you can see my patient here. Uh, her name is um, uh, Corey, and uh, she was actually on, she was again in her 20s by the time we did this and enrolled her in this project for genome sequencing. Um, and you can see there that she's got a, um, uh, a small uh, deletion um, across a couple of exons in the gene for coffin serous syndrome, uh, which she now in retrospect matches quite well, though she's probably the oldest patient in the world with that condition. Um, and so she's very happy uh, now to know what's, what's going on for her as well as being an advocate. Um, and so it was it, a lot of our discovery was that kind of thing, things that, that exome sequencing just was not really good at picking up. Um, and so uh, after short read genome sequencing, we had a look for those um, uh, who were still had nothing compelling. They moved on to RNA sequencing um, and RNA sequencing only done 42 families. Well, actually, we've done 200 now, but 42 that have been completely analyzed, um, of which we got uh, three diagnoses. Um, now, the challenge with RNA sequencing is um, getting the right sample and having genes of interest uh, expressed in the right sample. So it is a time when all patients have to come back in, et cetera. So it's a much bigger slog. Um, but you can sort of see this example here. Uh, the control is the second one, uh, and the, the individual, the patient, is the top one. You can see with that purple loop, what that's showing is that there is a splicing difference um, in the patient. Uh, and this is a patient who had um, quite a recognizable condition. So we had a very good idea of where to look, um, which, was, which is um, uh, spinal muscular atrophy with progressive myoclonic epilepsy. And he was in his early 30s, actually. Um, and so this is a great approach. And most of our uh, successes have been identifying a second mutation in a recessive gene when we already knew about one. And finally, I, those who sort of don't have anything after those and are still compelling, they move on to long read genome sequencing. And we've done our first batch of 14 families with multiple individuals from these families. Um, and so this is just an example. Uh, you can see the family over here with a number of affected people. They have a 46XY disorder of sexual development. And so um, males can be uh, completely normal external genitalia all the way um, to completely female external genitalia. Um, and females are generally just um, carriers. And so this family uh, was the one with a 40 year diagnostic journey um, that when this clinic genetics clinic was set up in uh, first set up over 40 years ago, this generation was seen. And when I joined, I started to see the second generation who were affected. So they had exome sequencing, short read genome sequencing, RNA seq, and we had nothing. So they went on to long read genome sequencing with four read uh, with four affected family members. And they have a 2.7 KB insertion in the gene NR5A1 in intron 4, uh, which is just shown here in with the purple. And uh, this is a gene that is known to cause 46XY disorder of sexual development. Um, and the in, we've done functional studies now on um, dysgenic tes testicular tissue to show that that um, insertion actually changes um, RNA expression, et cetera. Um, and so we've convinced ourselves we have the right answer. And this, uh, all the diagnoses we've made with long read sequencing so far have been intractable to all previous technologies. So just in summary then, when we look what we have so far, um, we have looked at over 1,200 families. And when we look at the reanalysis of the existing data, which is generally coding exome data, we have an 8% diagnosis in known genes and a 7% gene discovery published. So that's 15% 
a yield that you can get from data that already exists, which is, again, why I'm emphasizing that it's so important to have an ability to have an approach for secondary use of data. Then of those families so far that have gone through, which is just over 200, we've diagnosed um, and convinced ourselves of um, with 14% diagnostic yield. Um, and of those, um, short read genome sequencing and RNA seq and long read have all been successful. Um, and you know, it's unfortunately it's uh, expensive to do all three at the the same time. And there's probably approaches as costs come down and things change that we'll be able to use. But um, it's difficult to to know which one is going to solve which family. And so the goal here is um, ultimately to diagnose all families that have something that can be found. And, you know, you can argue theoretically whether or not that's, um, you know, should we be looking at 100% or 70% or 50%? Hard to know. But I think we've got evidence now that, um, you know, with the current criteria we're using for, for exome sequencing, 30%, solid 30% get a diagnosis. When you reanalyze um, that data after a few years, you're going to add 10%. And when you bring in discovery, you're going to get another 10 to 20 percent or so. And that that number may decrease with time, but it's certainly at the beginning, it was as high as 20 percent. And then with that group, you're going to get those that have a genetic cause. But for whatever reason, like mosaicism, you need to do deep sequencing, which I didn't talk about our work in that today, but it's been quite successful. Um, or you're going to need RNA-seq or short or long read um, genome sequencing to look for regulation, gene regulation or genomic alteration. Um, changes. And then there's going to be this group out here for sure, patients that we see in the clinic that look like um, maybe they may have a monogenic cause, but actually they're, it's more complex than that. And I think, you know, over the next five to 10 years, we'll be able to do some work with polygenic risk scores um, and other sorts of, you know, interesting ways to look at the data to get an idea um, uh, in terms of you know what is that contribution in the clinic and and what are what what families you know are more likely to have something that's more complex uh, like that um, and so then we find ourselves back to almost where we started right so we're starting to see the utility like there's definite utility in these new technologies in RNA seq and short and long read genomes uh, which are currently not funded um, for reimbursement in in anywhere in Canada and most places in the world. Um, and so we come back to where we're at, um, but I hope we're a little bit smarter now in terms of understanding um, the bottom-up approach, which is my reality, but in terms of engaging um, decision makers very early about what kind of data they need to see um, to be able to consider um, this as a reimbursed test so that families who need it um, can get it. And then finally, um, I just wanna say, um, that we've been really focused on the diagnostic odyssey, but there is a thing called the post-diagnostic odyssey, and we can't forget that. So um, we've been very focused on, you know, diagnostic care pathway and making that from seven years to six months um, and getting that diagnostic clarity there. But then families just come to a new odyssey, um, which also needs a lot of resources and thoughtfulness. And that's, you know, now they've got their diagnosis, but now what? Um, and that can be a really challenging time, and it's a different set of stakeholders, um, but something we're also very interested in. But it really comes down to, you know, then being able to access the right expertise, um, access to treatment and community supports, the fact that for some, some of these newly discovered diseases, there's no standard clinical care guidelines. And so it still becomes important for the um, clinical and research community to share their data about their patients. Um, their natural history um, and support them in their Facebook pages and other ways that they connect to each other and their, their conferences that they have to help address um, the challenges around coordinated care for these new diseases, the social isolation, the isolation that can come for that, and making sure with things like the rare disease models and mechanisms network that there is a scientist somewhere studying um, aspects of this disease, either with respect to biology or to treatment, if that's appropriate, um, so that they we can sort of take these thousands of diseases and and make sure that there's work being done in, in all the different areas and not just in the you know common 500 or so. Um, so with that, I wanna say um, thank you very much everyone for listening. I promised about 15 minutes for discussion at the end. Um, I just wanna recognize um, 
the uh, sets of funders that you see on the left and the right hand side and the national networks that I'm representing today, which represent hundreds of people um, and lots of work uh, that they've done over the past decade with us. The funding that we've shared from all of these funders across the country for the last 10 years. Um, and we really want to recognize them with respect to the um, very impressive investment they made for um, bringing rare genetic disease forward for Canada, which you know we couldn't have done any of this uh, without them. So thank you. Dr. Boycott, thank you for the great talk. Um, have you had any experience with cases with a variant of uncertain significance or unknown significance or novel gene candidates where lipidomics or metabolomics or any of the other omics, I would say, um, help resolve the diagnosis? Uh, and similarly, have you had any experience with using proteomics data alongside that genome data? Yeah. So I would say um, uh, limited experience. So we do have um, a metabolomics and a lipidomics part of our pipeline, which I didn't really talk about today, mostly because um, not a lot came out of it. Um, so um, lipidomics, this is challenging in terms of how you capture the sample and, and freeze it and send it off, et cetera. And it's very, uh, both lipidomics and metabolomics are very influenced by medications and nutrition and, you know, what you ate yesterday, et cetera. Um, but we have had a few examples, I would say, particularly in metabolomics that have pointed us um, to um, a pathway um, that, uh, or validated the fact that we've seen variants in a particular gene in a pathway, and you can see it sort of go off. We did, we have tried lipidomics for um, uh, um, the, the gene I showed you at the very beginning, um, ABHD16A, for example. So we collected that entire cohort, fibroblasts and blood, sent it off, but we couldn't find a signature, even though that should have a lipidomic signature. So it's really challenging. Um, so I'm actually more excited about proteomics, actually, um, because I think there may be something about that that it's a bit more stable, in which case some of those signatures might be easier to find um, uh, than the lipidomics or the metabolomics. And I will, the last thing I'll add is that the um, epigenetic uh, signatures are actually pretty phenomenal. And we work with um, Beckham Sedidovic at London Health Sciences here in Ontario, who um, developed EpiSign. And so many of our patients go on to EpiSign. And we have many variants of uncertain significance in which he can read out the signature in any of the 70 signatures that he's currently running. Um, and we've made several diagnoses that way. Yeah, that's great. And obviously, that is that confusing train track that you showed there and all the challenges that are associated with that. Um, next question, structural variants, translocations, copy number variants happen a lot and could explain some of these diseases and cases. Novel hybrid genes can also be a cause. Um, what are you doing to uncover some of those relationships and, and, and they're specifically to rare diseases? Yeah, that's a great question, Aziz. Um, so um, we've done a, um, a little bit of work with that with our short read genome sequencing, and I wouldn't um, um, say we're amazing at it yet. Um, we've sort of... Um, probably actually, I'm trying to think about it. Uh, we've definitely um, looked at lots, been able to find lots of CNVs, but translocations, for example, are a hybrid gene we've not yet found as a cause. Um, now, we're trying to focus that in the long read data. Um, and some of the challenges around the long read data um, that we're facing right now is the 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 huge number of controls that you need to have in order to be able to um, filter out some of the noise. Um, and so we're collecting those as we go along and our analysis, I think, will get better with time. But right now, there's a lot of stuff structurally that happens in a long read genome. And a lot of it is just noise. And so it has been, I think, still quite challenging. Um, uh, and we'll get better with time. That's great. I've also had a couple of questions that have been emailed to me. Um, but I had, before I get to some of those, I want to ask a question about the cell phenotyping, because I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, you know, cell phenotyping is dictated both by the form that you provide people, but also on their own perceptions. I'm curious how that compares to you know, expert phenotyping, either from a, a medical specialist or from a, a medical geneticist, uh, or even the stuff that's coming out now with uh, phenotyping through AI and machine learning? Yeah, it's a great question, Timothy. I, and I just love talking about self phenotyping. Um, so when we first did this, I alluded to, we had 10 families that had been families of in my clinic for a super long time. They were really uh, very high medical literacy, let's say. They got 100% when they phenotyped their kid. They got it all, um, but they did. They did tend to add in more things about you know things like that were very important to them, like tummy aches or headache, headaches or things that we wouldn't necessarily use as a phenotype term to to um, 
to, you know, to review the data, but, you know, they thought were really important things. The way cell phenotyping works is it goes by system and it is, um, it has been developed for families. So, so it's family level literacy and at the back end maps to human phenotype ontology. Um, and what we found in the prospective study so far with the first 50 or so we've recruited is that some families, um, even though they've agreed to do genome-wide sequencing, didn't actually think there was anything wrong. Um, and so don't really know to say things like developmental delay or intellectual disability, especially if they're little, um, hypotonia, you know, key things like that um, don't really come up in the phenotyping. Now, sometimes um, the variant is just so darn obvious that you can figure it out with very little <laughs> clinical info. Um, but I would say when we compare, there's a huge gap between what clinically we provide and what families are providing in a prospective study. What's the uh, what's the answer there? Is it AI? It's probably AI. Yeah. Yeah. If somebody can text mine um, the letters and be, uh, like the clinic letters, for example, and and pull out of that the appropriate things, that's probably the most efficient way to do it. A uh, question here, um, and I know Canada has some special um, some special emphasis, uh, particularly with First Nation. But uh, inclusivity and accessibility for diverse populations is a real challenge in the United States. And wondering uh, what approaches Canada has to make sure that those communities and, and people from diverse backgrounds are represented in, in your system. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so new Canadians, of which we have many, as you probably know, uh, we took the most uh, new uh, Canadian or new new people to a country last year than any other country, I think, in the world. Um, uh generally are coming and are be, being, come a, being, being part of the urban community. And so their access is excellent. They get their, um, for example, they come to Ontario, they get their OHIP card within three months. They're completely covered. Um, the challenge um, with the new Canadians uh, is generally language barrier. and But often um, they have um, uh, patient navigators, family navigators to help them through the system, but it, it can fall apart, as you can imagine, and can be challenging. So that's sort of some of the approaches we've taken there. Um, with the indigenous um, populations and the population that we serve a lot of is the Inuit um, from Nunavut, um, we do a lot of remote care. So we do, the pandemic really helped with that, quite honestly, our ability to do really quite high quality virtual care now for the, the near North and the far North, um, has become quite exceptional. Now in places like none of it, families still cannot do that from their homes because their Wi-Fi is not good enough up there. Um, and they have to go to the local hospital to get into the appropriate supported network, but it still prevents them from having to spend two days traveling down to here um, and still allows them to access the same testing. Uh, next question in the chat, how much of the results are available in the electronic health record as discrete data? And are data models and standards robust enough for those types of complex data? Oh, good question. Um, it's not great with respect to discrete data. Uh, we have not implemented the genomics module because uh, I think it's actually kind of in its infancy from Epic <laughs> that happens to be our provider. Um, and so often, unfortunately, what's happening is um, uh, for all the tests that are not done at our local institution, it's not discrete data. It's coming in as scanned PDFs attached to a test. And so the way we've used that challenge in the ThinkRare search algorithm um, is actually to say whether or not they've ever, like if you've been seen by genetics, you're not eligible. So that takes out a huge hunk of that, that we don't have to worry about the fact that they've already been seen by us. Um, but it's super, super challenging. And I think, you know, the, the challenge over the next 10 years is going to be how to actually move those genomic specific variants of interest, whether it's their diagnosis or their pharmacogenomics or what have you, in as a discrete variable, which we have not solved yet. Yeah, I think a lot of people are struggling with that. Um, question, I understand the focus on monogenic disorders since high complexity rare diseases would be pretty hard to solve, but what about diseases caused by pairwise interaction between only two genes? Um, such as when one gene usually compensates for a problem with another or where two, three proteins have to interact, two to three proteins have to interact uh, to perform a function. Have you ever, have you done any work, whether clinically or uh, research on some of these lower complexity scenarios? Yeah, we have not. Um, our data is available for anybody who wants to do that. Um, I think we're going to need much bigger data sets than we currently have, though, uh, in genomics for RD. Um, like we only have five, 6,000. I think you're going to need 
I don't know, 50,000, I'm just making this up, um, with uh, families who have, or patients who have overlapping phenotypes to try to crunch out that um, computationally, at least those different contributing factors. I think it's absolutely fascinating and complex and something we haven't even started to crack, but is the is it's the next next huge frontier, which will have its whole own set of challenges for sure. I hope people are asking themselves how can they how can they connect and collaborate with all the great work that you've done. Um, what about for Care for Rare or All for One? Is there any opportunities for collaboration among other other organizations or uh, professional yeah. organizations or even individuals? There is with Care for Air, and, uh, and I didn't talk about this today, Timothy, but in Care for Air, our data can become available to any of our um, trusted partners. Uh, we call, and that's particularly useful for what we call one sided matchmaking. So, for example, you're running one of your undiagnosed programs, um, which I think you called PROUD. Is that what they said? Yeah. Um, uh, and you find an interesting variant in a patient, you want to come into our database and say, have you ever seen it in Care for Rare? And what's the phenotype? And does that have a patient have a different diagnosis? And so that's called one-sided matchmaking. It's done in a tr with a trusted relationship. So partners, collaborators, um, and just allows them to come in and ask that question. Um, and so there are a lot of groups now that are kind of working on one-sided matchmaking is a really fairly efficient way to make data available quickly. Um, but that's probably one of the easiest ways to collaborate with this. Well, I want to thank you again for taking the time um, with us today. I really appreciate uh, you do describing your journey through this uh, and, and Canada's journey through this. Uh, it's quite fascinating. I think some of the challenges that we we face as not having a national health care system um, are, are pretty evident uh, for what you're doing. So I, I think, um, but really what you've done both on a research side and, and really, again, thank you for the work you've done for patients everywhere uh, in doing this. Uh, so with no further questions, I think we'll uh, we'll end today's Sim Grand Rounds. I want to thank everybody who attended. Thanks, everyone. Lovely to meet you.